We are getting into uh, the second half of Acts chapter 1. Um, so Pastor Mike uh, last week began that a little bit. There we go. Um, Pastor Mike began that last week um, just by introducing the, the book of Acts, giving us a little bit of background, um, but also communicating a little bit of what the, uh, really the intent and purpose of this, this book is and what this book reveals about us. And so, um, you know, we, we talk about it being Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, but it really is um, the Acts of the Apostles through the Holy Spirit, right? Or uh, put another way um, that Mike said last week, it's the people of God filled with the power of God advancing the kingdom of God, right? And so we looked at the very beginning of Acts where, where Jesus, before he ascends, he takes us into this, this place where he talks about, you know, that we, we are to be his witnesses, right, in, in, in all the world, right, in, in Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. Um, and I think that, that is sort of our, our beginning statement was looking, all right, so, so before Jesus ascends, he, he instructs us, right? He gives us, the church, this, this command where he says, look, you, you are to be my witnesses. You are the people. I, you know, the work, it is finished. So now here we go, right? And so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to empower you, the people of God, with my spirit to go and advance my kingdom. And that was sort of our charge for last week is understanding our place in that and understanding the power of God to, to do that, right? That he does that work in us through his spirit, right? And one of the last things that Jesus says before he ascends is, right, I, was, I will give you my Holy Spirit, right? And we see that in the book of John. We see that in other places in the Gospels. This promise, right, where Jesus says, I, I will be with you, right? Even though I'm not physically here, I will be with you through my spirit, right? And so, um, this brings us to this second half of Acts chapter 1, which is looking at, all right, so we've got the promise of this spirit, now what, right? Um, and I have to say, this is, you know, <laughs> probably the sermon that I think I'm probably least equipped to talk about, and, and we'll talk about why that is in a minute, because it, it puts an idea out there that I know I personally, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't always fit my personality, uh, and so we're going to look at that in a minute. Um, so a couple things, uh, right, let's understand that this is, this is again, coming from Luke. Um, so in a lot of ways, this is the, the part two of his gospel. And so as I was looking in this week, I was able to see uh, some really cool parallels between what was happening in, in the gospel of Luke and what he revisits in the book of Acts, especially in this beginning. So I'm going to mention a couple things on that through, through this as well. Um, but let's look at actually the very last tail end of something that Mike shared last week. And this is Acts chapter 1, 10, and 11. So before we get into chapter, or verse 12, Let's look at this, okay? So it says, um, so this is, this is the apostles now, right? They're all gathered. Jesus is ascending into the sky, and it says, they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven, right? So I imagine that there's probably this picture where they're all like, you know, they're watching, and they're just kind of there, and I'm sure that they're in awe, right, of just like watching this, this amazing miracle of Jesus' ascension. And they're there, and they're kind of staring, and, you know, it's maybe like when you watch like a balloon, and you're like, how far up can it go before you can't see it anymore, right? Like, there's just kind of that like, he's still going. Again, I, I can't even imagine what this looked like, right? What this physically would have felt like to watch a person ascend. Like, at some point, do they disappear? Like, I have no idea, right? I've never seen this. I can't fathom this. But I do imagine that they're all kind of looking up, and these two, you know, again, the Bible describes as angels, you know, the, these figures in white, coming up and just kind of being like, what are you looking at, right? Like, he, he's, he, yeah, like, go, go right? Um, you don't have to look up anymore, right? This, this same Jesus will come back, but now go and do, right? It's almost like the end of Ferris Bueller's Day Off, where it's like, you're still here, right? It's over, go, right? Like, that's, that's this kind of moment where, like, and I have to imagine that there was probably in their minds this, this sense of awe, but also this sense of fear. Because now for the first time, right, like they, they have seen Jesus die. They've seen him resurrected. They have spent time with the resurrected Jesus. And now he ascends, and there's this promise of his spirit. But again, I don't, they probably don't know what that looks like, right? I mean, I don't really think I fully understand what it looks like sometimes when I know, talk about the spirit leading me, Right? So there's probably this moment of like, I don't actually want to look down because I don't really know what's next, right? And this idea of, uh, there, there is an uncertainty, I imagine, in those first couple steps of like, now what? Okay, we're all gathered. What's our first step? What do we do after the ascended Christ has already left, 
right? And what do we do in this waiting period where we know that there's a promise of the Holy Spirit, but we have no idea what that looks like. We have no idea when. We have no idea in what form. We really, we really don't know, right? And so I imagine that these first steps that these apostles were taking were absolutely filled with a sense of uncertainty and worry and, and a little bit of maybe even doubt of like, well, okay, maybe, maybe this is, you know, maybe this won't happen. Maybe the, right? even, even as they were watching the Ascended, Matthew talks about, but some doubted. Right? So there's even still in that moment that, that um, kind of inner conflict um, or inner dialogue that we sort of have with ourselves when we're like, God, I trust you, but I'm not really sure what this is going to look like. Right? And so that's really where we pick up. Okay? Um, so this is where verse 12 picks up. So what do they do? Well, what did the first thing that they do, okay, well, is they return. Right, so let's look at this. It says, Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. And when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. And those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They were all joined together constantly. In prayer. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now, just real quick, I just think that that is amazing, right? It, it, we've talked, you know, that this mention, this is actually the last time Mary is mentioned uh, in scripture in terms of chrono- chronology. Um, and this is, this is really amazing. That here, here's this woman, right, who has birthed Jesus. She has watched her son die. She's watched him resurrect and ascend. And she is still part of the early church, right? She is still part of this uh, the beginnings of what God is doing with, the, with the, the promise of his spirit. And I think that's just really an amazing testament that, you know, it's not, when her son's out of the picture in the sort of physical form, that doesn't stop her from still being committed to the work and the, the, the truth of what he, and who he was. So it says, In those days Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. And he was one of our number and shared in our ministry. And let me stop there for a second, too. And I think this is also really very telling, that this is, they mention Judas, right? This is really the first time I, we, we actually encounter a conversation about Judas as the disciples, Right? Like we know the story. We know that Judas betrayed. We watched that, right? Like that's played out in Gospels. But here is them, them kind of reflecting on that. And then he makes a point to say he was one of our number and shared in our ministry. So I have to imagine there's also in the midst of this uncertainty about where God is going to be moving next and what his Holy Spirit looks like, that there's also a level here where they're still, I think, in pain and grieving that one of their own, right, people that they have committed three years of ministry together with, people that they have trusted Right, that that person went and not just betrayed Jesus, but I think betrayed the, the community. Right? And so I, I actually think there's probably a lot of pain here. So it's very easy for us to kind of look at these scriptures and take our, the humanity out of it and just sort of like, all right, well, it's telling a story. But I think that story for these disciples in this moment is, what's God going to do next? What do we do without the physical presence of Jesus with us? And how do we reconcile the pain of the fact that our, our community has been wounded a little bit? So this is the stuff that they're carrying into this next sort of part of their journey as, as a group. Keep going. And with the payment, and this, this is now, this tells the backstory, right? Luke, so Luke didn't, doesn't tell this backstory in the gospel. So he uses the book of Acts as an opportunity to kind of fill in the backstory here. So with the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field, and there he fell headlong. His body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. It's nice, right? Um, everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, and so they called that field in their language uh, Akeldama, that is the field of blood. And then in verse 20, it says, For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, May his place be deserted, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. And he is pulling there from two different Psalms that he is referencing. So, G- so Peter, in this point, is bringing back um, two specific passages in Psalms and using that to kind of... Um, makes sense of what, what's about to happen, okay? So therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been taken with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was, uh, who have been with, excuse me, the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of this resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. And then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. 
show us which one of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. And then they cast lots, and the lots fell to Matthias, and so he was added to the 11 apostles. And that's the end of the chapter, right? So you, you, we have to ask ourselves, all right, Luke, what, what are you trying to do here with this? Like, what, what story are you trying to tell, right? If you, if you are the author of this story and you're trying to communicate these, again, this idea of the people of God filled with the Spirit of God advancing the kingdom. So what, what do we take away from this, right? What do we learn from this about who God's people are or who God's Spirit is, right? Or what does it look like to advance the kingdom? Because if not, you could just kind of gloss over this and be like, all right, exposition, just, just filling us in the details, and now we move on. Let's get to the good stuff in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit comes, right? And I think it's easy for us to kind of jump to that second ch chapter because that chapter is so rich, and it talks about, again, God's Spirit moving very directly, but I don't think we can dismiss these, you know, dozen or so verses. There's something very important that I think Luke is understanding about who God is and who we are that he wants to use this passage to communicate. Okay? So let's kind of pick this apart then and get into some of the specifics of that. Okay? So I think the purpose of this passage, right? I think why he takes the time to insert this into the story is because this is the space in between. Right? This is the point where Jesus has left and before the Holy Spirit comes. And so it's in that interim period that we really have to wait. And that's difficult. And I mentioned to you before, this is a hard thing for me to preach on because I don't like to wait, right? I, and not that I don't think I'm, I can be a patient person, you know, but I, I think my patience is not on how, it's not, <laughs> my patience is not when it comes to time, right? I want to get things done. I want to move quickly. I want to, all right, let's, what's the plan? Let's go. Let's get things done. Let's problem solve, right? That's a very easy place for any of us to be in, but that's not necessarily what God is asking us to do. Right? And so let's kind of pick this apart. Okay. So, well, the, the great prophet uh, Thomas Petty, right, said that the waiting is what? The hardest part, right? And I think in some ways we have, we have adopted that in our culture, right? Um, that that is, that is the thing, like, oh, man, if we just, can, we just get to the next thing, right? Right? Um, I'm sure your kids ask this question when you're driving, right? Are we there yet? How much more time? When are we going to be there, right? I'm sure I asked that question as a kid, right? It's just because that is, there you go, um, because that is, that is, that's our culture, right? In a lot of ways, our culture is about, what, let's, okay, let's forget the waiting period. Let's go from here to here. And so we've, we've I, I think, adopted a language that says the waiting is the hardest part. But I don't think that that's what the message here is. I think that the message here is flipping that narrative and saying, wait a minute, the waiting might be some of the best parts. And the waiting might be the periods where we get the most out of our relationship with the Lord. Right? Because it's very easy for us to look at this and say, wow, Jesus left and he's absent and the Holy Spirit comes and he's present again. But that doesn't mean that, Jesus, that God was absent during these 12 verses, right? In this period, God is very much present, but we just need to see how that plays out. And I think, too, this speaks to a freedom that we have when we allow ourselves to sit in the waiting period, right? I think we want to move past it. I want to move past it. But I think there's actually a lot of freedom and a lot of reward in sitting in the waiting, okay? So let's, let's break that down a little bit further. Okay, so in the waiting, I think what we are asked to do, I think it, I, frankly, I think it compels us to seek him first, right? So let's, let's break that down. First off, let's talk about, again, what we would do. I know for me, if I was, again, one of the apostles, and I watched Jesus ascend, and it's like, okay, now what? I'd be like, all right, let's strategize. Who's our, uh, our go-to? Who's our, who's our publications? Who's our publicity person? All right, we got to get the word out about our church, right? And we got to do that. And I, there would be like, all right, who's, who's skills and who's We would come into this sort of team aspect of like, all right, all right, let's all, let's all divide and conquer. We're going to delegate. And, right, and we would instantly go into like, again, problem-solving mode of like, all right, it's time to, it's time to we got to get a banner. We got to get a this. We got to start moving. And that's not the first thing that they do. The first thing that they do is they join together constantly in prayer, right? The first thing they do is they retreat back to this upper room and they gather together 
and they pray, and they stop, and they listen, right? And we talked about these sort of, um, sort of life rhythms that, that Mike was talking about in our previous sermon series. Right? One of them is that idea of Sabbath and rest and seeking God and being still. And again, I think this is my area of most uncomfortable because I just, I just want to problem solve, but God's calling us, no, no, no. Let's draw together. Let's sit constantly in prayer. Let's wait. Let's watch him work. But not only that, so, so there was, there's some, it's very funny when you look at like different, you know, I was watching YouTube videos of some different pastors and speaking on this, trying to get a sense of like, okay, what are, what are people saying? When there's been two schools of thought. One is that um, the disciples, when they were picking a new person to fill in for the role of Judas, right, that they were moving too quick, that they weren't waiting for God. And others are like, no, 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 they were seeking God. And so there's this kind of dilemma of some people saying, like, was this, was this a good move to appoint Matthias or not? But I, I want to point out to what is actually, I think, happening here, and not to get caught up in that, like, silly argument. And I think what it is, oh, do I have it on here? Where'd it go? Let me go back. Sorry. Uh, okay, verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, right? Numbering about 120. He says, brothers and sisters, the scriptures had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David. I think that is actually the core of this conversation. Because not only do they gather to pray, but Peter says, let's go back to what we know to be true. And we know that the Old Testament, right, gives us insight. We know that his word is truth. So let's go back to that. And what's really particularly cool about this is that for Peter, this is really one of the first times that he actually gives voice to this, okay? So the way that uh, these sort of ancient biographies are set up is that when they have these points of speeches, right, and this is now a speech on Peter's part, right, it's usually not just to kind of, again, give information, but it points to a character development, something that's happening to a person, right, something about their character that, that needs to be highlighted. And what I think is cool about this is not only does Peter point us back to the Old Testament, or point them back to the Old Testament, um, but Peter articulates that the scriptures had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago. Now, the, why that's important is Jesus, for the most part, has been saying, look, I am the fulfillment of the scriptures. I am the fulfillment of the scriptures, right? This is about me. I've been, the story of the Old Testament is about me. And the disciples haven't gotten that. And now we get to Acts, and what does Peter say? I got it. I got it, right? And actually, in Luke, it says that he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. In Luke 24, one of the last sections before Jesus ascends, there's an acknowledgment of this, that when he spent those 40 days, it says that Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So what's really cool about this is in this moment, Peter, he gets it. He gets, wait a minute, we can go back to the scriptures and understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of that. That he is at the center of our scriptures. And so we can see our current experience by going back and understanding that Jesus is at the center of this. And that gives us clarity for how we can encourage one another. Right? So, as, so if Peter's seeing Jesus as the fulfillment of the scriptures, right, he is now pointing people to God's word. Right? He's calling these believers of 120-some people, and he's saying, wait a minute, let's point to God's word. Let's look at what his word says. Let's find rest in that. I know we're uncertain. I know we're not sure of what's happening next, but this is what we know to be true. So as we pray and seek the word together, and that, that speaks of a really tremendous jump in Peter's leadership, right? that he is able to do that. He's able to, to gather people and say, look, let's look at God's word together. And so I, I have to just share that, you know, tonight in our encounter night, this is, this is kind of what we want to do, right? Um, as we enter a 40-day period of, of sort of Lent, of, of this period of, of uh, preparation for, uh, for Easter Sunday, it's, it's about gathering and it's about praying and it's about seeking his word together. And, and the songs we sing, right, are a lot of times scripture set to, to song. And it's a reminder of who our God is. So I, I just want to press on that, that what we do tonight isn't just, again, a, a, a time just to, to make cool music, but it's about doing this exact thing that the apostles are doing in Acts chapter 1. They are gathering to pray, and they are gathering to be reminded of <coughs> who God is in the fulfillment of the scripture. Amen?
All right, second thing. I'm going to go all the way back. I think in the waiting, it reminds us to be the witnesses of the hope of Jesus. Right? So, again, waiting, sometimes we're impatient. Sometimes we're bitter, right? If it's at the DMV or at the doctor's office, right? Like we, we have these areas in our life where we're like, oh, God, oh, just right? And, and I think our waiting oftentimes is a time where we are negative, we are bitter, and we feel inconvenienced and we get angry and we harbor these, this negativity about our circumstance. But that is not what they're doing in this waiting period, right? They're not negative. They're not bitter, right? They are, they are being reminded. They're going back to the scriptures, as we said, to, to be reminded of who Jesus is. And actually, if we go to Isaiah 40, okay, Isaiah 40 says, Yet those who wait for the Lord gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. And the word wait for there is actually the Hebrew word kava. Right? And kava doesn't mean, wait, right? It, it is to eagerly hope for. And that is the kind of waiting that we're looking at here. It is an eager waiting. It is an excited waiting. It is, I, I just, I just so excited for what's going to happen next, right? And again, for me, I tend to look at waiting as inconvenience, and I'm bitter. But what I learned this month is that my son Isaac he was really great at this when it came to his birthday, okay? Isaac turned eight on February 10th, and man, was soon, three weeks before, we had a countdown calendar, and every day he would wake up, and he'd be like, what day? And he would cross off the next day, and he was, he was excited and eagerly hoping for this day. That was, that was the world for him, right? And he wasn't bitter and impatient about it. He was eagerly excited and hopeful, and he would just beam from ear to ear, smiling about how excited he couldn't be. So many more days till my birthday, and I was like, man, he captures the joy of in the waiting period, right? There was joy in his ability to wait. Again, not that he, did, he wanted it to be here, but there was joy in the excitement of coming down and crossing off another day and knowing that that was going to be fulfilled, right? He trusted that that birthday was coming, but he was able to wait in excitement and anticipation and joy. He was able to, to kava, to eagerly hope. And I think sometimes we forget that, right? Our whole life is waiting. This is not our home, right? And so it's very easy for us to forget that, to get caught up in the little moments where we forget that God is doing something so much bigger than what we sometimes see. Because the truth is, the Christian life is about waiting with eager anticipation and hope for our glorious King Jesus to return, for him to be present, for him to restore all things, to bring all things under his authority, right? Where we see a new city where death and sin and sadness are wiped away, right? That is our story. That's a great story. And so we're in the waiting. But it's okay. Because we know the end of the story. There's a, um, there's a pastor uh, out in Seattle that my, uh, my family, we listen to. His name is Justin Thomas. Um, and uh, he's been doing this sermon series over uh, politics especially. But one of the things that he says when he talks about the nature of the church is he says, you know, we are... We are ambassadors, right? The scripture talks about this, right? Being ambassadors of Christ. But we're specifically, our embassy is in the future. We are, we are time travelers. Because the, the world that we're speaking of, right? The land that we're representing, the kingdom that we represent is a kingdom of the future that we are living in now to tell others about. And I thought that was really particularly stuck with me. That we, we get so caught up in the here and now that we forget that we are representing a nation that is coming. And so we wait in kava, in eager hope and anticipation of that. Now let's be clear. This doesn't mean that they sheltered away and just kind of stayed there. Because there is a tendency in this too 
to just kind of like, I'm just going to wait, 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 and hope that God speaks. And like, we, we, it leads us to inaction sometimes. And, and let's be clear, that's not what's happening here, right? The, they say in verse 21, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time. And so they, they do go about the task of completing and fulfilling the, the, the restoration of the twelve. Right? And that goes again. They're, they're looking back to Old Testament. And they see the connections between 12 disciples and 12 tribes of Israel. And so for, for the Jewish culture that they're representing, that connection point between the Old Testament and their current situation, that there was a driven need to want to bring those numbers back to 12. So what do they do? Well, they talk about that we want somebody who has been a witness of his resurrection. Right? And so among the people that they pick, being a witness to the resurrection is critical. So they, they are building the team, right? But they're building the team by relying on scripture, by praying together, and by eagerly hoping. Okay? And I think it's important, too, that they talk about that they want a witness of the resurrection. They understand the importance of the physical resurre- resurrection of Jesus. That they wanted people who could speak to that who could say, look, I firsthand have seen this. And so that's the team that they're building. People who can, not people who could be the best at publicity or the best at organizational management, right? They wanted somebody who was a witness to how Jesus transformed their life and a witness to the power of Jesus in his resurrection, the supremacy of Jesus. Does that make sense? And so, this brings us to the third point. In the waiting, we need to rest and remember God's sovereignty. That waiting is an act of dependency. Uh, Back when Laura and I actually got engaged, we were out in South Africa um, on a a six-week trip uh, with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and we were doing... um, a lot of like servant work. It was like uh, you know dealing, looking at, at the AIDS crisis in South Africa. We were um, working in an orphanage. Uh, again, it was it was a lot of very kind of like physical things. But there was a day we were at this um, college, and we were like already and prepped, and we were like, yes, we're going to go raise awareness for Jesus, but we're also going to address HIV um, because again, that that's a really significant problem in South Africa. And so we were we were ready for the task of like going and doing. And we get there, and we get invited into one of the college students' dorm room, and we're sitting, and they put on the TV, and everybody's talking, and we're like, this is great, but when are we going to get to the work, right? Let's get to the work. And I remember, we were, you know, and again, when every time you travel and you do any missions work, right, there's, there's always this little bit of cultural tension because, you know, how we do things and how other people in the world do things are different. And there are times when those cultural moments clash, right? And so I remember very vividly, like, I was clearly annoyed. Um, and I, you know, like, Laura and I were kind of just, like, lost in this place. We were, we were so focused on, like, man, what a, oh, like, we wasted the whole day because we felt like we got to the end of the day and we did, like, maybe an hour's worth of work, and then it was like, all right, we'll see you all tomorrow. And we were like, what was that? Like, why did, what, why, we do, why did we waste a whole day sitting in the dorm room and watching TV with these South African college students, right? But the reality is, is that we were meant to be building relationship in that time. And we missed it because we were so focused on the task, we wanted to go and do, that we missed that God was doing a work in the relationship he was trying to build. And the truth is, is that I need, frankly, like if I confess, I I needed to surrender that God was sovereign in that moment and that my agenda didn't matter because God's going to do his work, right? And, And I had to surrender that in that moment, they were my authority, right? The people who organized this, and I needed to come under that. I needed to be dependent on their timeline, not my own. And I think that's exactly what's happening here. By them allowing themselves to wait, they are saying, God, I am trusting in your timing, and I am letting you be my authority. He will build his church no matter what. No matter what. Right? There's nothing you can do to screw this up so bad that God goes, well, that's ruined. I guess we're done, right? He, he, there's nothing we can, he, we are not that powerful, 
right? Now, that doesn't mean that there won't be wounds and consequences to things, right? And let's understand that, that that doesn't mean that we are free and, like, to be reckless and irresponsible. But he is bigger than that. So what do they do? They pick a person. And how do they do it? They pray, right? And I love this prayer. Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen. Simple statement of surrender. And then what do they do? They cast lots, right? They get a ceramic pot, and they put a bunch of names on some tablets with some symbols, and they shake it around, and they pick a name, and they go, all right, Matthias is the one. Now, we might look at that and be like, this is like eight ball, magic eight ball ministry, right? Like, this seems so bizarre to us to be like, all right, Jesus says it is good, right? Or check back later, right? Which was the most frustrating, right? But... Like that, that, the truth is, is that that's not, that's not foolishness. That is an understanding that God will build his church no matter who we choose. And so we say, God, you are in control. Show us which of these two you've chosen. And then we're letting you, we're trusting that you will direct this path and that you will be God. And we are okay with that. And we're going to rest in that. Isaiah 46, uh, where'd it go? Did I not put it on here? I didn't put it on here. Isaiah 46 says, verse 9, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet, God, d- yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. There it is. I will accomplish my purpose. He will see his kingdom come. And so what we can do in this is rest and trust in his sovereignty that he will accomplish his purpose. That he is big enough, he is capable enough, and we are just called, what are we called? We're called to love God Seek him first, and we are called to be witnesses for the hope, to love others. And that is the freedom of waiting, is that he's got this. We are free to love him, to seek him, and to love others, and spread the hope of who our Jesus is. Amen? One last thing. I want to go to this verse. This is, this is uh, by the way, this is uh, Romans, okay? It says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up into the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who've had the first fruits of the Spirit, grow inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And then this is this part. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And it's that last section. The Spirit intercedes for God. The will of God. See, this story is the last story before the Holy Spirit comes. This is actually the last time in recorded scripture that they cast lots. Why? Because it's in us after this. Because the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us. So it's, it's an amazing picture that we not only have this beautiful period where we get to wait, but we now have the promise that the work of waiting is actually being done in us through his spirit. We don't have to wait on our own efforts. There's a, again, South African pastor um, named Andrew Murray. 
And he says this, it is God's spirit who has begun the work of waiting upon God. He will enable you to wait. Waiting continually will be met and rewarded by God himself working continually. And I love that because, again, I think it's very easy for us in these kind of sermons where we go, all right, I just, I just need to work on being more patient. I just got to really work at it, right? I just got to do it really well, and I'm just going to try harder next time, God. And what this says is, no, no. See, not only do we have this amazing period of freedom where we get to wait and watch him work, and we're free to love God and love others, but the work of waiting is actually done through his spirit in us. That's an amazing promise. That he says, not only am I going to give you this space, but I'm going to give you the strength and the patience and the waiting spirit to be able to do this, right? I will enable you to wait through my spirit. He takes care of everything. All we have to do is come under that sovereignty. So, again, I, I don't know where this looks like for you. I don't know where you're at in your life. I don't know if you're like me and you're like, God, I hate to wait. I hate, and I see it as a negative. I see it as a setback. I see it as something that gets in the way of other things that he's working at. But I, my prayer for us this morning is that we would be set free by this story. That we would be set free by the passage where God says, I'm doing this work in you and there is freedom in l- being with me and letting me work through you, and letting, their, let, letting my spirit enable you to enjoy my presence. Because I'm working. In fact, we're going to be singing uh, in a few minutes, the, the worship team's going to come back up, and we're going to sing the song Waymaker, right? And that bridge, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop working. Remember, God wasn't absent in these 12 verses, 14 verses. They just weren't quite seeing it, but they believed that he was working because he never stops. So I want to close with this prayer, um, and it's from Psalm 27. And the verse says, it's Psalm 27, 13, 14, I am certain that I will see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. I'll see his goodness now. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart be courageous. Wait for the Lord. Again, it's twice. (laughs) If you missed it the first time, wait for the Lord. So let me pray. So Father, God, we we so often, I think, view waiting in an Americanized, limiting way where we see it as something that gets in the way of the tasks we want to accomplish or we see it as an absence of you working because we don't see it because you're not physically there in that moment but that that is so not true that is that is a lie and that is in a lot of ways a a sign of our own uh, lack of dependence on you so God I pray this morning that as we reflect on this passage, we wouldn't miss it. That you were growing your church in that period. That when they were gathered and they were speaking scripture over one another, when they were praying over one another, when they were seeking you, you were actually doing the work in that moment. That you were present with them. And God, I pray this morning that we as a church would adopt a culture of waiting on you. God, that I, I personally would continue to, to, to be refined in that as well, Lord. That we would not get so focused in the task and not get so focused in what we define as ministry that we miss what you're doing. And that we miss those opportunities to connect with you, to read scripture together, to pray over one another, to trust in your sovereignty. And that ultimately, Lord, when in those waiting periods, God, as we wait for your kingdom, that we would be free to seek you first, that we would be free to tell of the hope we have in you, and that we would rest in your sovereignty. 
pray for rest this morning. God, as we reflect on these words in Psalms, that we are certain, God, let us be certain that we will see your goodness right now, today. That even when we don't see it, we know you're working. So Lord, we wait on you. And I pray that your spirit would work in us, that we would be strong and courageous. Not by our own strength, but by your strength and your spirit. Because you do the work. We surrender. And we wait on you. In Jesus' name, amen.